Hello and welcome to the fifth session of our Geology of Scotland online course. The course spans over six weeks in which we try to give a brief overview of the chronological formation and deposition of the major rock units of Scotland. With the exception of the first session that provided a general introduction to the course, each of the following sessions centers upon one of Scotland's terrains. These represent fragments of continental crust bounded by major faults that experienced a unique series of geological events and therefore have a unique sequence of rocks. In the present configuration, these terrains are assembled in decreasing order of their age from the northwest to the southeast. So far, we've covered the Hebridean terrain the Northern Highlands terrain, and the Grampian terrain. And now that I've just mentioned the Grampian terrain, which we discussed last week, before we proceed with today's presentation, I would like to make a quick mention. Last week, after we reviewed the Talradian supergroup, we briefly talked about the Grampian phase of the Caledonian orogeny that was triggered by a volcanic arc colliding with Laurentia. And then I said that the volcanic arc detached from Gondwana and crossed the Iapetus Ocean before colliding with Laurentia. That's not how it happened. The volcanic arc terrain that collided with Laurentia to trigger the Caledonian orogeny was an interoceanic arc. In other words, a chain of volcanoes that formed in the closing Iapetus Ocean advanced towards Laurentia and eventually collided with it. For some reason, last time I had Athalonia in mind, which is an arc terrain that indeed detached from Gondwana and also collided with Laurentia, but this happened at a later point that we will briefly mention next week. I apologize to all of you for this, and please just remember that the volcanic arc responsible for the Grampian event was a volcanic island arc that formed in the closing Iapetus Ocean. And by the way, we will discuss volcanic island arcs in just a few minutes. Today's presentation is dedicated to the Midland Valley terrain, which is located south of the highlands and is bordered by the Highland Boundary Fault to the northwest and the Southern Uplands Fault to the southeast. And it consists almost entirely of rocks of Paleozoic age that are about 500 to 250 million years old, so considerably younger than most of the rocks that we've met so far in the other terrains. Let's start as usual with the oldest rocks, which are also known as basement rocks, and represent the solid foundation on top of which gradually younger layers of rocks are deposited. An interesting fact about Scotland is that the more we advanced from older terrains to younger terrains, the basement rocks appear to become hidden. That's not to mean they don't exist, they absolutely do exist, but they outcrop less and less frequently. And this is perhaps what contributes to the mysterious character of Scotland's most recent terrains. Because most of Scotland generally has extremely old basement rocks, some of which date back more than 3,000 million years, it was naturally assumed that the Midland Valley was underlain by similarly old rocks. However, the basement rocks of the Midland Valley are much younger and are not even of Precambrian age. To put it in perspective, they are about six times younger than the oldest rocks in Scotland. These rocks that outcrop on a relatively small area in the southwest of the terrain represent the Ballantrae complex that consists of an assemblage of rocks of mostly igneous origin called Ophiolites, which make for a unique occurrence in the south of Scotland. Ophiolites are extremely rare and interesting rock assemblages, and what makes them so interesting is that they are the result of a disruption in the normal course of plate tectonics. In a normal scenario, when a continental plate and an oceanic plate meet, 
The oceanic plate usually sinks underneath the continental plate in a process called subduction. The reason behind this is that the oceanic plates, although are only about half as thick as continental plates, are much denser. And this is because the rocks that form them, namely basalts, are rich in heavy elements like iron, which is naturally dense. The continental crust is much thicker, but is made of granite, which in turn contains lighter elements like silica. So despite the thickness, these light elements give it the property of being more buoyant. However, sometimes in the process of subduction, a fragment of the oceanic plate becomes trapped and thrust onto the continental plate. This process is called abduction and results into an ophiolite. Ophiolites normally consist of a succession of rocks characteristic of the upper mantle, the magma chamber, the oceanic crust, and the overlying sedimentary cover. After being thrust over the continental plate, only in very rare occasions do ophiolites remain intact. This is because as the oceanic crust is consumed and the ocean closes, the two land masses that were on opposite sides eventually collide, so the ophiolites get caught in between and become exposed to all of the processes that normally occur during mountain building events burying, faulting, melting. As a result, they are severely dismembered, to the point that it is almost impossible for the assemblage to be preserved in its original sequence. Let's see in a bit more detail what rocks make the Ballantry complex. The rocks that originate at very great depth in the upper mantle are called ultramafic rocks which basically means rocks that are very rich in very heavy elements. And an example is peridotite, which is a very dense igneous rock. When tectonic processes bring this rock close to the surface, especially close to a subduction area, water from the subducting oceanic plate interferes with the crystal structure of the minerals, and peridotite becomes metamorphosed into another rock. The interesting fact here, which can also be a bit confusing, is that metamorphism by definition occurs when rocks originating at a shallow depth are buried at a greater depth and exposed to high temperatures and pressures. In the case of rocks originating at a very great depth, metamorphism occurs in the opposite way. So the higher up they are brought, the more changes they undergo. This is a very specific kind of metamorphism that affects rocks of the upper mantle that come from the deepest parts inside the earth. It's called serpentinization, and the resulting rocks are called serpentinite. This is a very fine-grained rock that doesn't adjust very well to the surface conditions, so it's very easily eroded. If we look on a map of the Ballantrae complex, we see that there are two parallel belts of serpentinite. They are not similar, but occurred in different settings, and the original rocks, the peridotites, in the northern belt, originated at greater depths and were more intensely altered than those in the south. The next rocks that we would meet in a normal sequence of an ophiolite are the magmatic intrusions. They mostly represent the ancient magma chamber and its additional network of smaller intrusive bodies that acted like a piping system and provided magma with a way of reaching the surface. The magma chamber is usually represented by gabbros, an igneous rock with large grains while the network of smaller bodies is made of rocks that represent a transition between the coarse-grained gabbros and the fine-grained basalts that erupt at the surface. And this rock is called diabase. 
However, if we look on the map again, the remnants of these magmatic intrusions are poorly represented and appear as small patches scattered across the area. And finally, the volcanic and sedimentary rocks represent the oceanic crust and its sedimentary cover. The volcanic rocks are mostly pillow lavas that form the ocean floor as lava erupted. They have a distinctive round shape, much in the form of a pillow. Some of the lavas have suffered severe deformation and appear arranged in very tight folds which makes it difficult to determine the thickness of the layers. The sediments that covered the ocean floor are now represented by shales and chert. Shales are very fine grained and are the consolidated form of silts and muds. Chert is usually composed of the remains of microorganisms. The lavas and sedimentary rocks are the most widespread of the components that make the Ballantrae complex. The Ballantrae complex originated in different tectonic settings, but is mostly associated with volcanic island arcs. These represent a chain of volcanoes that develops in places where two oceanic plates meet. When this happens, the older plate, which is heavier, subducts underneath the younger plate, which is lighter. Water from the subducting plate accelerates the melting of the upper mantle of the overriding plate. This also increases the gas content of magma which eventually erupts violently and forms a chain of volcanoes. The process is the same as to when a continental volcanic arc is formed. The difference is a continental volcanic arc involves continental crust, while volcanic island arcs involve only oceanic crust. Two notable features of volcanic island arcs and also of continental volcanic arcs but we now talk about volcanic island arcs, are the sedimentary basins that form in front of and behind the volcanic arc. Now, in front of and behind are considered relative to the trench, the very deep fracture in the ocean floor that marks the actual subduction point. So the sedimentary basin that forms between the chain of volcanoes and the trench is the forearc basin, while the one that forms on the other side of the volcanic chain, away from the trench, is the back arc basin. These two basins are usually filled with material resulting from the erosion of the volcanic arc, and also with a product of eruptions, including pyroclastic material. As the volcanic arc approaches the continental margin, the forearc area also becomes filled with sediments coming from the continent. Now, let's focus on the Beckarc Basin, which is a particularly interesting feature. The formation of these basins used to be quite a mystery, because subduction areas have long been associated and are still largely associated with compressional forces these are forces that push from opposite directions towards each other. And indeed, this is the kind of force that is responsible for subductions. But as the subducting plate sinks, the edge of the overriding plate is pulled forward and downwards at a higher rate, which creates a lot of tension. So as the crust underlying the volcanic arc is stretched and thinned, the back arc basin forms. It's a process similar to continental rifting, only it involves oceanic crust. As the oceanic crust gives way, lava erupts at the surface, creating a new spreading center. It is possible that the rock assemblage of the Ballantrae complex originated from not one, but several volcanic arcs formed from around 500 million years ago onwards in the closing Ayapitas Ocean. 
These volcanic island arcs gradually advanced towards Laurentia and eventually collided with it. The first collision marked the beginning of the Caledonian orogeny, namely the Grampian phase. Most of the remnants of this arc are believed to make the basement of the Midland Valley, but remain buried under younger rocks. At least another volcanic arc followed around 450 million years ago and also collided with Laurentia. Eventually, all the components of the Valentry complex, namely ultramafic rocks, the magmatic intrusions, and the volcanic and sedimentary rocks, were metamorphosed to a certain degree. This happened as the much hotter rocks of the upper mantle were thrust onto the lavas of the ocean floor. The Ballantrae complex is covered by a local sequence of sedimentary rocks that was deposited about 460 to 430 million years ago. Several inliers of approximately the same age spread across the southern half of the Midland Valley. All of these rocks were deposited in a marine environment and generally record a transition from shallow to deep waters in the case of the Ballantry cover and from deep to shallow waters in the case of the inliers. Let's move on to the next major rock unit in the Midland Valley, and that is our old acquaintance, the Old Red Sandstone. It is the third time we meet the Old Red Sandstone, and I've been waiting for this session to discuss it in a bit more detail. As a general time reference, when we talk about the Old Red Sandstone, we are at the end of the Caledonian orogeny, so a broad approximation would be 400 million years ago. The Caledonian orogeny brought together a series of continents and microcontinents. The largest of them were Laurentia and Baltica that were at their second collision. Only this time Baltica also had Siberia attached to it, so the resulting landmass was even larger. This was called Laurasia and was also nicknamed the Old Red Continent, an obvious reference to the Old Red Sandstone that covered significant areas of this landmass. Besides its widespread occurrence, part of the fame of the Old Red Sandstone comes from the fact that it represents the solidified detritus that was eroded away from the Caledonian Mountains. At this point, some of you will probably have realized that we deal with a spectacular process of recycling of rocks at a geological and global scale. Whenever there is an impressive mountain chain, it is inevitably eroded and the resulting material accumulates in time to form either a new mountain chain or a significant rock unit. In this case, we have the Grenville Mountains that formed about 1000 million years ago when Laurentia and Baltica first collided. Back then, Amazonia also joined them to form the supercontinent Rodinia. The Grenville Mountains were eroded and provided sediments that would later consolidate and metamorphose to create the Caledonian Mountains. And then the Caledonian Mountains were eroded and provided the sediments that would consolidate to form the Old Red Sandstone. The name Old Red Sandstone is a bit deceptive in that although sandstones prevail, it is made of a whole range of sedimentary rocks from conglomerates to sandstones and mudstones, sometimes intercalated with volcanic rocks. The sediments were deposited into a series of basins throughout the Old Red Continent and can now be encountered throughout the North Atlantic region from Canada and Greenland to Scotland and Scandinavia. In Scotland, the Old Red Sandstone was deposited in three major basins, characterized by different depositional environments. The Orcadian Basin, located in the northeast of Scotland, was filled with sediments deposited into a large freshwater lake. The other two basins, Strathmore and Lanark, are both located in the Midland Valley and contain sediments of largely fluvial origin. 
The Strathmore Basin lies to the north. The Lanark Basin lies to the south. Let's have a brief closer look at the latter two basins. And the striking thing we notice is that they occupy the extremes of the Midland Valley and are both separated by faults from the neighboring terrains. At the time of sediment deposition, these basins were also separated by a volcanic mountain range. During the Caledonian orogeny, the Highland Boundary Fault and the Southern Uplands Fault were active and moved laterally. As the neighboring terrains were uplifted, the Midland Valley was sinking. This gives it the typical aspect of a gravel. The sediments in the Strathmore Basin have been largely carried from across the Highland Boundary Fault and laid down into a huge braided river system. Although this image is not from Scotland, the initial deposition of the Old Red Sandstone occurred in a similar setting. The earliest sediments were sandstones and conglomerates. As fault movement intensified, the basin started to subside or to sink, allowing for the accommodation of more and more sediments notably coarse-grained sediments that tumbled down the basin margin, but were then followed by fine-grained sediments carried by rivers on a southwest direction. Volcanic eruptions also occurred at this time. The deposits of the Lanark Basin are considerably smaller than those of the Strathmore Basin. They are also less compact and very faulted, so they appear almost as isolated outcrops. Much like the deposits of the Strathmore Basin, the sediments here also range from coarse-grained to fine-grained and were also carried by a network of rivers flowing towards the southwest. Volcanic rocks and layers of lava appear interspersed throughout. The deposition of the Old Red Sandstone in the Midland Valley is marked by a major unconformity. In other words, the deposition occurred in two episodes divided by a period in which no deposition occurred. This period is related to uplifting and deformation caused by the third and last phase of the Caledonian orogeny, called the Acadian. This phase did not affect Scotland, at least not directly. The deposits of the Old Red Sandstone in the Midland Valley have accumulated thickness of about 10 kilometers, which is almost a record amount of sediments. There is not one place where a complete succession of rocks can be noticed. The closest to complete succession can be seen on the shores of the Firth of Clyde in the circled area here. This is a picture of the Stonehaven area, which is located at the northeastern tip of the Midland Valley, very close to the Highland Boundary Fault. That's the oldest of the Old Red Sandstone that was deposited in the Midland Valley. The Late Paleozoic Era comprises the time span between 360 to 250 million years ago. And as we can see on the map, about half, if not more, of the rocks of the Midland Valley formed in this time interval. They are represented by a mixture of sedimentary and volcanic rocks that alternate with coal deposits and record different depositional environments, but also major climate changes. And indeed, these 100 million years were marked by a cyclic climate change. The period accompanying the final deposition of the Old Red Sandstone was characterized by an arid climate. And these conditions lingered until after the first late Paleozoic sediments were deposited. So the patches of dark purple on the map were laid down still in arid conditions and are mostly represented by sandstones. 
After that, the climate changed to a very hot and humid climate as Scotland approached the equator. There were extensive wetlands with a lot of vegetation and a system of rivers and deltas. Organic material accumulated into swamps where it formed peat and eventually coal. So the following rocks to be deposited, both sedimentary and volcanic, alternated with coal. The sediments were carried by rivers from the neighboring areas of the highlands and the southern uplands and were generally deposited into a marine environment characterized by episodes of sea level rise and retreat. Volcanic eruptions were common within the Midland Valley and generated lavas and pyroclastic material. As the climate was changing and was becoming arid again, the sea retreated and the marine depositional environment was replaced with a fluvial and deltaic environment. And this is when the coal deposits reached their peak. The very end of the late Paleozoic era was marked by a return to the arid conditions. And this is when the last important sediments were deposited. They were sandstones, very thick layers with a typical reddish color, reminiscent of the old red sandstone. Now that we reviewed the major rock units of the Midland Valley, we can draw a few conclusions. The Midland Valley is one of the two youngest terrains of Scotland, with basement rocks younger than 500 million years. The oldest assemblage of rocks is represented by the Ballantrae Ophiolite complex, which consists of a heavily dismembered section through the Earth's upper mantle the overlying oceanic crust and its sedimentary cover. This rock assemblage is believed to have originated in different tectonic settings, but is mostly associated with a volcanic island arc that formed in the closing Iapetus Ocean. The Bellantrae complex is covered by a local sequence of sedimentary rocks of marine origin and early Paleozoic age and similar inliers also outcrop along the southern Midland Valley. The next chronological unit is the Old Red Sandstone that consists of very thick layers of sedimentary and volcanic rocks deposited in two marginal basins. The Old Red Sandstone was followed by the late Paleozoic deposits represented by sedimentary and volcanic rocks and coal that formed in a diversity of environments from arid to equatorial. The more recent deposits of the Mesozoic and Cenozoic eras are almost insignificant. The Mesozoic rocks outcrop on the Isle of Arran and the Cenozoic units are represented by igneous intrusions. Finally, we notice on the map a multitude of small areas in different hues of red those are all magmatic intrusions. The dark red ones date back from the Caledonian orogeny, an event that, as we will see next time, marked the assemblage of the British Isles. The bright red areas, which make the majority, are related to the Variscan orogeny that accompanied the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. And the light red ones that we mostly see on the Isle of Arran are part of the Hebridean Igneous province and were in place during the opening of the North Atlantic Ocean. And here we are at the end of today's presentation. Thank you very much for watching and listening and see you next week for our last session. I see that okay? So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about fossils that you get from the early Carboniferous of the Midland Valley terrain. Um, so Alex mentioned a bit in his presentation about those later uh, uh, sediments in the Paleozoic. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and my name is Katie Strangles, I get to introduce myself, but you've all probably seen me before. And I'm secretary and one of the trustees for the Scottish Geology Trust. 
So just having a wee look at the paleogeography of where Scotland was in the Carboniferous, you can see there that it's lying at really low latitudes near the equator. And as has been mentioned, that had an impact on the type of climate that we experienced during that time. And when you think about the Carboniferous, like Alex mentioned, it's very, very famous for coal. That's where the Carboniferous gets its name from, and because there's loads of coal, coal deposits wow. from that time. That's cold, isn't there? Now, the map here on the right is showing you the different coal fields and the map on the left is showing you uh, the whole of Scotland, but the population density. And something that I always think is really interesting is just how closely related uh, these are across the Midland Valley. Essentially, all the towns and things you still see it today and um, we're all based around these resources that we had, uh, these geological resources. But today, instead of talking about the coal, I'm actually going to talk about limestone. So limestone is a marine rock which is composed of calcium carbonate. And it was really, really important throughout the Midland Valley of Scotland uh, for many reasons. And one of those is that we actually exploited that resource, um, not only to burn to make lime mortar, but we also used to burn that for agricultural purposes. And it was used as a felt up fertilizer. And that was really, really important during the Industrial Revolution as uh, population started to grow and things. And um, we needed to be able to produce more crops and having this resource, this lime, was super important. And these images are from the Charlestown Lime Works in West Fife. And on the left hand side, you can see them working in the quarry and um, absolutely no health and safety standards whatsoever. On the right hand side is an old picture of the historic lime kilns. Now you can still visit these lime kilns and um, they're down at the harbour. Uh, the railway line is not there anymore, but you can sort of trace that further uh, west and join on to that. But that's one of the first and mineral railways of Scotland. And because of the perfect location of Charlestown on the Fourth, it meant that you know we had access to trade routes and everything, but also this the development of the railway later on meant that we were also able to bring limestone from other places out with the, the village. So I'm going to talk a little bit about not the industry today, but actually about some of the fossils that you find within these limestone deposits. And one of the great things about the Carboniferous and the fact that we utilised a lot of these resources means that we actually have quite a lot of knowledge on the different fossils and the different types of animals and plants that lived throughout that time. But today I'm going to focus mainly on the marine limestones. So before I go into the Carboniferous limestones from about 330 million years ago, uh, this is a modern coral and this is from the Great Barrier Reef and the photo is from the uh, Natural History Museum in London. Now when you think of reef environments like this, you quite rightly think of tropical oceans warmer climates and when the sea level rose in the Carboniferous because we were closer to the equator we did at times experience these really humid climates but the coral reefs that we had back in the Carboniferous are very different to what we know today and but we do know now that you do get coral reefs in cold waters as well so uh, they don't just occur in these warm environments but they are very important uh, throughout geological time. But as you can see in modern coral reefs, one of the reasons that we want to protect these is they're an absolute haven for diversity. All kinds of life thrives uh, based on these corals. And it was very similar back in the Carboniferous. Now this image here is of what's called a bioherm. Now coral reefs back in the Carboniferous weren't what you would really call a skeletal reef um, like we have today. Um, they were mostly composed of things like microorganisms and other animals like crinoids and bryozoans and uh, early Carboniferous corals. And all these animals helped trap the sediment together and then over time precipitated this calcium carbonate. And this is from a, a quarry face. So um, it's a very nice sort of section through that bioherm. And you can see this sort of mound that's developed here. And within these rocks, you find such a diverse uh, fossil assemblage. So one of my favourite things is crinoidal limestone. So a lot of our limestones in the central belt are composed primarily of crinoids, um, more specifically the stems of crinoids. Now, crinoids are sea lilies, um, but they're actually animals, not plants. But they get called sea lilies because these ones from the early Paleozoic used to have stalks which attached to the sea floor. And these stalks had a calyx, which is a cup that held its arms, and the arms would filter feed from the seawater. 
But when they died and got broken up by water currents and predated on and other things, they were very, very fragile, which means normally in the fossil record, what we tend to see is just these absolute jumbles of bits of stem fragments. You do sometimes find uh, bits of cup or calyx, which are really important helping us identify the crinoids, um, but it creates this very, very beautiful uh, limestone. But what you can also see in these little bits of rock here are these sort of mat-like things, and these are known as bryozoans, which also get called sea mats. And these are actually still alive today, but so are crinoids, um, although stocked crinoids tend to live in deeper water and are a lot less common. So during the uh, Carboniferous period, particularly the Bicean in Scotland, um, which this limestone is from, we had um, a very, very high diversity of crinoids. And um, these bryozoans or sea mats uh, that are still around today, you actually see them if you go to the beach and have a look on shells that are washed up, uh, bits of seaweed, just other hard bits of material, you'll find that these uh, bryozoans like to cling on to them. And these rocks are about 330 million years old, and you can just see how amazing that preservation is. You're really just looking at a snapshot uh, back in time there. And we also have um, these colonial rugose corals here, which um, the left sample is from uh, the limestone in West Fife here, and the right-hand side is from East Lothian. Now, these colonial corals um, would have lived, and there would have been one little animal in each of the uh, coral tubes here, and they would have sort of grown together, and you would have found other animals in amongst there as well, so sometimes you have solitary corals. But the reason these are colonial is because there would have been, you know, hundreds of thousands of animals living within these structures. And these are quite important because these coral horizons in the early Carboniferous limestones aren't particularly abundant. So that means we can actually look for these layers in the rock. And that tells us where we are in the formation, which is, is very useful when you're out and about looking at rocks. And here we have on the left hand side an example of a colonial coral again, and this is weathered really beautifully. So you can see that the actual uh, coral is standing out um, because the softer matrix is weathered away faster. And the reason that this is kind of a orange weird color is because this whole part of the formation has been quite extensively dolomitized. So dolomite is a magnesium carbonate, and you find with quite a lot of the limestones throughout the central belt that they have undergone dolomitization, which means that a lot of them are now composed with quite a high percentage of magnesium carbonate. And on the right hand side, we have a solitary rugose coral that's been cut and polished. And the solitary corals sometimes get called horn corals. You get rugos and tabulae um, normally in this limestone. And when you cut them, you're able to see the internal structure. And every time the coralite, there would have been one animal lived in one of these structures. And um, every time it would secrete a new layer of calcium carbonate. And this calcium carbonate that they were secreting, that all built up over time and is what uh, became the limestone. And other animals that you get within these waters were invertebrates like these uh, brachiopods. Now, brachiopods are in their own phylum. Um, they're a bit like uh, similar to bivalves that you get in the modern day on the beach. So bivalves are uh, a mollusk, but brachiopods, um, they have a different line of symmetry and they have, they're more closely related to bryzoans than they are to bivalves. And you can see here that these examples actually got pretty huge. Now this one on the right hand side is about 30 centimetres across and there's not really any reason for these animals to have got this big. It's one of those kind of debates that's always ongoing about why did they actually get so big because they were kind of sedentary animals. So that means that they just kind of sat in the sediment, didn't really do much, they just sort of filtered and you know there, there wasn't a reason. They didn't have sort of a high intake of nutrients that would require them or a high output of energy that would require them to get to this massive size. But nonetheless, they did, and they're very common amongst these Carboniferous limestones, and they are like really, really cool when you think of how big they are. Sometimes you can see them in cross-section of the rock, and you can see where the valve was sitting. So when I was talking about lines of symmetry, um, in a bivalve, the, sorry, in a brachiopod, the line of symmetry is down the centre of the, the shell here, whereas in a bivalve, when you look at it, the line of symmetry is between the two valves. 
Um, that's a good way to tell the difference between the two. This image here is a reconstruction of an early Carboniferous tropical sea. So kind of what I was talking about with these coral reefs, you can see in the bottom, um, they look very different to what we sort of know today as a coral reef, but these environments were secreting this calcium carbonate, these animals, which built up over time. But you can see that it wasn't just invertebrates that were living amongst these uh, oceans, there was actually vertebrates as well. And it's a really important time in geological history when it comes to sharks, and uh, this part of the early Carboniferous is known as the Golden Age of Sharks. And this is because at the end of the Devonian, when a lot of the life in the ocean had gone extinct, it meant that the sharks didn't really have any predators. So in the Devonian, things like the armoured fish, the placoderms, would have been top predators to the sharks. But because in the Carboniferous, they didn't really have this, it meant that they were able to exploit and adapt to a lot of different ecological niches, which saw a really great diversity in sharks across the Carboniferous. So here um, I'm going to show you a couple of my favourite types of Carboniferous sharks. So uh, these uh, pictures here are teeth from a shark known as Petalodus acuminatus. Now, petalodonts are probably the most common. Um, they usually were quite small in size. And um, the reason they're called Petalodus or Petalodonts is because their teeth are sort of thin and flat and they are reminiscent of a petal. Um, there's a diagram up here of a drawing of what it would look like. So this part here is the crown, which is the cutting edge of the tooth. And this part here is the base or the root. So what would have been in the shark's uh, jaw? And one of the really interesting things about the shark teeth is that because sharks, um, to be sharks, are composed of cartilage, it means the only thing we tend to find in the fossil record is the teeth. And that's because a lot of sharks actually have rows of teeth and every time they would lose one, a new one comes to the front to replace it. And that means that they're quite abundant in the fossil record. And these tend to be pres uh, preserved in a sort of calcium phosphate material, which means they usually uh, stand out quite significantly against the, the rest of the rock. But these were really interesting sharks and it's really interesting to try and think about the shape of their teeth and what that would tell you about what they were eating. So these shark teeth, even though they're over 300 million years old, um, are definitely still sharp because I have accidentally cut myself on a few now. And um, it just, I think it's amazing that, you know, the striations after all those years are actually still um, sharp and could probably cut something um, other than my fingers. And the uh, things that they would have been doing with these teeth are probably slicing fleshy stuff. So they're probably eating other fish and things. They probably weren't eating things like mollusks because that would require teeth where you were able to actually uh, grind up the shells of the animals. So they're really, really fascinating. Um, and as I say, the petalodonts are probably the most common type that you get in the, the Carboniferous here. And then my absolute favourite shark is this one known as Cyvodus striatus. Now these teeth probably look more shark-like or what we would more recognise as a shark today. So they have this really distinct central cusp which has a really sharp point. And these sharks um, are known as primitive type sharks to do with their teeth or they're also called cladodonts. And they have these uh, really intricate little cusps here. And what is really cool about these is we know that animals with this sort of uh, morphology of their tooth, so that means like the shape of their teeth, um, they would use these to actually pierce their prey and then literally swallow it whole. So these were really, really gnarly. Um, this reconstruction here uh, is showing you roughly what it would look like, but again, we do tend to only find the teeth of these animals, but quite recently over in America, they have found some uh, cartilage, some articulated remains from Cybotus, which is really, really exciting. So um, you never know, there might be material out there in Scotland that's still waiting to be found. We do have cartilage from other sharks, but um, none from Cybotus so far. And on the right hand side here, you can see um, sort of a, a group of teeth. So there's a uh, three really visible ones here, and this is on a block of sort of crinoidal limestone. Um, and what's really cool is you just kind of get an impression that these teeth, you know, drop down to the ocean floor and have just been preserved for, for so many millions of years. 
And this is actually, it looks like a piece of normal crinoidal limestone, but this is actually a block of a sort of iron rich uh, mud material. So it's like there was a ball of mud rolling about on the sea floor and it's just picked up all these bits of crinoids and teeth and uh, they've just stuck there. It's really, really cool. And, but these are probably the most gnarliest uh, of the sharks back then and were probably one of the top predators. Um, so sort of research has shown that they probably grew to about six metres, but uh, more modern research has shown that they could probably get up to eight metres. So uh, we're always discovering new things all the time about these uh, types of sharks. So it's really exciting because, as I say, we, we tend to only find their teeth. So they're quite a big mystery. And just wanted to look quickly at some other sort of environments that we had. So it wasn't just uh, shallow marine seas that we had in the Carboniferous. And um, like you saw, we had those wet, wet swamp lands. And uh, we also had uh, freshwater environments. And in these freshwater environments, it lived a whole host of different types of animals. And here are just a few of my favourites. So on the left hand side, we have a plate here, which is full of tiny little fossil shrimp, which are known as water stonella. These are from East Lothian. And then on the middle, we have a shrimp called Telia caris, uh, which is a freshwater shrimp also from East Lothian. And they're not from the same site, but they were quite similar environments. And these were rocks that were laid down in what was known as Loch Cadell, which was an ancient freshwater loch. And the, this was around the margins of the loch. And because of the conditions of the environment there, there would have been quite a lot of uh, carbonate in there, but there would have been very low oxygen conditions at times, which allowed this exceptional preservation um, within these, these formations. And the one on the left hand side, um, this site is actually known as what's called a Lagerstatin, which means a site of uh, spectacular or exceptional fossil preservation. Um, but not for the shrimps, funnily enough, it's actually for conodonts, which um, maybe I'll talk about some other time. But um, on the right hand side here, we have uh, what's known as a rhizodont teeth. You can see here that's got that quite distinct it's just got that one cusp um, and rhizodonts were freshwater fish and they also grew to be pretty large and were one of the dominant predators during the, the Carboniferous. And this is a reconstruction here. Um, so you can just see the, how these teeth would have sat in the mouth. So they used, had these bigger teeth tend to be at the front uh, called tusks. And, you know, they were gnarly. Some of the um, museum collections, you see some of the teeth are absolutely enormous. So these fish could grow, um, you know, up to seven metres in length. So you, they would have been very gnarly predators of their time. That is me for fossils because I try I get very overexcited when I talk about fossils, so I try to keep it short and sweet. Great stuff, Katie. Um, right, our final presentation tonight, we've got John Taylor, and if we could get his slides up. Hi, John. Oh, we can see you. Your video is working brilliant. New camera. Yep. Um, Yes, uh, I'm John Taylor and uh, I'm not a geologist. Uh, I've been collecting rocks, minerals and fossils for 65 years, so my parents tell me, or told me, they won't tell me now. Uh, I don't usually carry a hammer for rocks and minerals, I just carry a really a heavy duty litter picker and search for eroded material, uh, a lot of it around rivers and beaches. And uh, firstly, I've got to say, Thank you to Katie for the last minute help with the photos as my selection kept scrambling and I'm fairly technology, technologically incompetent. Um, uh, so this is going to be very low tech and she will uh, feed or have the challenge of feeding the photos into what I'm saying. When I get my screen to share properly, I think that's okay. <laughs> too many presentations open at the one time. Can everyone see that okay? Yep, that's looking grand. Cool. Okay, so if uh, we start with uh, the, the first map, <clears throat> which is uh, uh, the one that you've been looking at previously from Alex's, so uh, the Midland Valley here, and uh, what I've done is chosen three quite different areas across the Midland Valley. Uh, so at the bottom, you've got Burn Ann near Kilmarnock in Ayrshire, and then further up you've got Burnt Island uh, in Fife and uh, higher up still. Is, is that visible Katie or uh, I'm not seeing it so is, 
is the top bit. Yeah, we're, we're sure. seeing to be some display problems. Um, we'll try. Yeah, there's a few, maybe, maybe some boxes appearing on top. Try again. It worked fine oh. the first time. Yeah. yeah, I think I've maybe just got too much open. I will try closing the presentation and opening it again. Up, up on the top. So from Burned Island, we'll go up uh, to the top to Lunan Bay and Orkmithi and the old red sandstone there. Um, I'll also try and attempt to continue the theme of surprises from uh, the introduction to this series. Um, and the first one will be going back down to Ayrshire and, uh, and there uh, I was over buying a lapidary saw from a lady whose husband had died uh, and seeing that I had a large truck, she uh, asked me whether I would remove a load of boxed rubble from her back garden. There was about 400 kilograms of it. And I wasn't that keen, but uh, put them in and drove off with it. Uh, and they were covered with about four inches of composting leaves as well. Very wet, slimy stuff. Um, when I got home, to cut a long story short, I, I sort of tipped one of the boxes out and I thought I'd try a couple of the rocks that were in there just out on the saw that I just bought and uh, surprise surprise um, it actually had uh, some very dirty looking rocks in it which are which are in the next photo and um, they didn't really sort of uh, appeal to me at all either but you know if you've got to try the saw out, then, then anything would do at the time. So uh, these are cleaned up. They weren't even cleaned up at the time. So the first ones I cut um, then revealed what's on the next photo. Um, and it turned out that I'd um, been given about 400 kilograms of Bernan agate. Uh, it's not all good because you, you have to really cut through an awful lot of it uh, to find the lenses that are in there that have all this colourful material in. But when you do find it, you know, it, it really does uh, stand out. Um, <clears throat> I, I assume that uh, the state it was in that had been dug up by a digger a, a lot of years ago because you, you can't really access mater ground material very easily. Uh, what normally happens is uh, people will hire a digger, usually collectively, because I think the digger hire stands somewhere around £1,300 a day to dig a hole, and you're not guaranteed of what you can find either. Um, so it's not easy material to find, and so I was quite happy with, uh, with what I got. Uh, it was a great surprise, and I'm sure for those of you who've, who've never seen it, just in this small sample, uh, you'll agree with Matthew Heddle when he said, it was unrivaled in beauty, and uh, as I say, this is just a small sample of, of uh, some of the some of the pieces I've cut so far, and I've still got it. Still got probably another three hundred odd kilograms to cut. So, moving from uh, Ayrshire to, to Fife and Burnt Island, um, you'll see a younger volcanic formation here. Um, some 320, 360 million years ago. Um, and on this, on this uh, map, you can see the basalt in the centre uh, with Burnt Island in the grey at the bottom. On the skyline um, of, of the next photo, just over the, you've got Bin Hill here, which um, has a radio aerial on the top, so it's very distinctive. And over the back of that, there is currently a, 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 an operational um, quarry which uh, which still quarries basalt and it's got some really nice sort of basalt columns in it as well. Although you're not you're not able to get in it, uh, the the people who own it don't allow access to it. Um, on the uh, hill there, we've well, got wooded slopes below the the sort of fairly unstable slopes higher up they're they're wired up so they're definitely unstable in a lot of places and the wooded slopes contain a very varied geology uh, 
that's historically been exploited for for the limestone, sandstone, and the shale that's that's still there, still in evidence there. There's also a, a large deserted shale village up there somewhere, which uh, I'd be hard pressed, I think, to point out. Um, and apparently, it said, uh, you know, it said that there there were potentially up to three thousand people working from this uh, on this shale at, at one time. <coughs> There's lots of erosion all around the hill and lots of quarry debris from from all these different quarries that that have that have been working there at different times and um where the basalt erodes uh, treasures can be found further down on the beach which is probably to the well to the left of uh, of this photograph uh under the sea there are the the basalt tuff uh contains a lot of calcite veins and quite long ones as well and these are being eroded out under sea level and occasionally throws up vein agate um, so the next photo is, is uh, showing some of the more pseudomorph uh, parts of the vein agate so you've got some calcite in there a little bit of agatization and you've got the calcite uh, structures uh, sort of around the edges and um, there's there's an awful lot of this sort of um, pseudomorphing within within these structures <clears throat> the uh, the next one is really showing how it comes up on the beach well, the, the bottom ones are cut but the, the top ones show the sort of crazy lace formations that you get there and uh, these are really sort of a, a a result of oxidation and sort of weathering in the sea and um, if you actually cut them you sometimes lose that patination on the outside. The next examples have, have been cut uh, and they're mostly small, they're, they're not, not very big pieces at all, but when they're, ex they're sliced they can actually expose other mineralization uh, which is much better seen under a microscope. Uh, there's moss agate in there, there's girthite in, in, in tubes, um, plumes and various other aspects I haven't yet managed to identify. Um, under UV light, the, the, the next two photos are under UV light, you'll, you'll get this really standout pink colour, sometimes a lot stronger than this piece. Um, and it's it's just great to to cut it and then then see what you get out of it. Uh, so the, the the next piece is actually showing something a little. The trying to get to this in focus was was quite difficult, but you'll see at the bottom there the UV light has actually picked out um, some botryoidal shapes, and um, this is actually more of a, a sort of golden browny colour than, than what's on this photograph, but it doesn't always come out well under a UV torch. Uh, and I haven't yet uh, identified what that is, but you can't uh, you can't actually see it when you're when you're looking at it under under a normal light. <coughs> so uh, the next one is quite. Uh, a unique one amongst all the ones that I've found. I've never found one that's had pyrite cubes in like this um, and they are, the, some of them look a bit squashed but they are quite cubic and um, so that, that's, a, that's a very unusual one and the, the, the pluming if you look at it under a microscope is, is sort of in the depth at the back of the pyrite. <coughs> The next piece is from the slopes of the hill. So um, where you've got small areas of crumbly lava, uh, it's, it's often got uh, amygdaloidal sort of calcite amygdaloids in, in, the, uh, in this lava where it is very, very crumbly. And uh, occasionally you'll find signs of other things, but just on one day I found about 20 pieces uh, of, of these clusters here and uh, they're, they're calcite and quartz primarily 
and the quartz is covered in dots of goatite and uh, there are nice honey quartz, small honey quartz is in, uh, sorry, calcites in there and rhombohedral calcites like the one that's completely on the, on the right hand side. That's probably the biggest one I found. Lots of smaller ones. And um, pseudo decadi do deca, sorry, I'll get this right. Pseudo do decahedral calcites on there as well. Um, but in the next photo, uh, just one cluster. There, there are more, more um, than just these two here. But uh, there was one cluster of, of double terminated quartz crystals, which actually uh, very difficult to photograph. And you can see there's 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 goatite on there as well. So uh, I think I'll move on to Lunan Bay now, and Lunan Bay has quite an, sort of an iconic view of Red Castle up, at, up on the top there. And uh, there's a buttress on the end that hangs over. So every time I go, I take a photograph because I'm expecting the, the whole bit of the, the wall to fall off one of these days into the river. Um, the, ri <coughs> the river itself um, crosses the beach and sort of washes generally uh, the sand off, off the gravel that's underneath. Um, what most people don't realize is that below a thin layer of sand are millions of pebbles and cobbles, uh, the recycled rocks that Alex mentioned. Uh, eroded, these are all eroded from the sandstone conglomerates and normally you only get them revealed uh, on sort of when the, the river has washed out the sand or the sea has washed the sand off the riverbed. There are a few other uh, gravel beds that get exposed occasionally as well during the winter, but just at the moment, there's more sand than certainly uh, than I've ever seen before. So not very much stone on, in evidence. And uh, sort of further down the, towards the south of the beach, there, there is often a, a good gravel bed there. And what you find on these gravel beds are not just the the, the cobbles that uh, <clears throat> that you find uh, along this 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 whole sandstone a lot of sandstone cliffs but you also find agates which are in in the next photo uh, are that's sort of a, a fairly good selection there although most of what will be found will be the the, the gray water line or onyx agates um, that's a very common occurrence for the agates in this particular area. But uh, very occasionally, you know, you find something that's that's just a little bit different. And uh, the the next one is was in the main photo, but the next one, next photo, uh, is one that was very very different. And quite how that one formed. If you take the the water lines that are on there as being sort of the level at which they were deposited or the level at which they built up. There's lots of different planes that have changed there throughout this, this whole agate formation and uh, individual agates in, in each one of the sections. Unfortunately, uh, the beach pebble event up at uh, Lunan the other weekend, I lost the other half of this one in the sand. Um, so it's there for somebody to pick up if, if you want to go and look for it. <coughs> uh, moving on to uh, Orkmithi, uh, we had a two day peach, beach pebble event at Orkmithi. Um, that's just a little bit south down the coast from Lunan, just around the corner of the, of the cliffs a bit. And uh, it's got stunning geology there. Uh, and I haven't put up photographs of a, a lot of the a uh, lot of the really nice uh, sea caves, arches, cliffs, the whole rugged sh shoreline that's there. It really does have some some stunning scenery. It has some of the best concentration of examples of the conglomerate cobbles uh, in one small beach. I think it was certainly <coughs> great for the uh, the beach pebble event for the festival and uh, we had geologists up in the hall who were giving two talks on each of the days and uh, people 
who couldn't get into the hall because it's packed out were coming down on the beach to us and uh, after the after they finished the talks uh which was this this was while a talk was going on up up the, the top so uh, not quite so many people when they came down i think we were quite busy but uh they were searching and having their samples identified um and the next picture sort of gives you uh, an idea of what the cobbles are like in situ and they don't really give much away you can't uh tell very easily what the different sorts of stone is and there's a huge range in there somewhere <coughs> but uh the the next photo will give you some idea of the range and this is just a small sample of of some that i've cut over the, over a period of time um You've got uh, in the top left, you've got two different rhyolites there. And uh, then underneath that, you, you've got a, a, a mudstone. You've got below that one, the big one in the corner there is, is a mixture of, of granite banding and rhyolite. Uh, you've got jaspers just above that. Uh, and in the jasper, the two jaspers on the right hand side. Uh, you can see there's a huge amount of hematite banding going through those. And uh, the the brown one above the two hematized ones is is very much a, a brecciated piece in its own right. So where did that originate Re originally before it came down um, and was deposited in you know in the uh, cliffs eventually? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's a there's a whole lot of stuff in there. There, there are some absolutely beautiful quartzites and over on the right hand side under the brown one on the top corner you've got a black quartzite you've got a green quartzite and a speckled black quartzite and under that you've you've got another green one which is actually sort of almost a almost a, a picture quartzite it's got a got a scene on it which doesn't show very well on that it looks like lightning coming down on hills and and a river and uh uh, a lake there and one of my absolute favorite pieces is the bit that's uh or three bits that are in the middle actually um i'm not quite sure what the formation is in the quartzite quartzite at the top of that pyramid but um it's it's certainly a beautiful pattern but the one underneath the outside of it looked like the smaller piece on the right hand side but when the inside was cut you can see the slightly gray color across to the right hand side of it that's that's all hematite you've got a lot of epidote in it and a lot of these stones have epidote in in them and uh, you've also got a fault line going up the middle where where you know, that shifted in its uh, in its evolution as well and you know i just find it fascinating to to cut and see this and then sort of just speculate on where where it all came from originally so there's always something new every trip, and uh, I could certainly recommend people to to go to Orkmithy. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Okay, folks. Wow, that was the Midland Valley, and uh, what an amazing place! And it's great to get the expertise from uh, Katie and John, just completely different aspects of uh, what can be seen in the rocks uh, so we'll finish uh, there um hang around if you want to ask any questions uh, otherwise we'll see you next week for our final session uh, on the geology of scotland <laughs>